Hello everybody and welcome back to Space Dock. I'm Hujuana and today we are taking a look at the big boys of gritty military sci-fi, devices used as either a staggering first strike or desperate last resort. Nuclear weapons. They are most often seen alongside kinetics and missiles in settings that, while not necessarily being realistic, aim to feel somewhat grounded in deploying weaponry in use today. Their most common appearance is when delivered by missiles, though sometimes hand delivery has been used for that personal touch. But while they may be extremely powerful when detonated in an atmosphere thanks to the dual effects of a flash of heat followed by an enormous pressure wave, they have some different effects in vacuum. To understand why, it helps to know what a nuclear device actually turns into upon detonation. Unlike regular boring chemical explosives that go surprise and turn into a large amount of very hot gas when detonated, nukes do something entirely different. Whether triggering a fission or fusion device, these take their fuel, apply E equals mc squared to it and turn its mass into various wavelengths of light, mostly x-rays with some gamma in there and a sprinkling of neutrons as well. It's the interaction these x-rays have with what surrounds it that creates a shockwave. Whether it's in the air or deep underground, all those x-rays are absorbed by the material, which heats it up extremely rapidly, making it expand so fast it generates a shockwave. When there is no atmosphere, there's no material around to absorb the x-rays, which means no shockwave. In vacuum, the blast is now almost entirely made up of the various high energy light waves and those obey the inverse square law. This law determines the amount of energy that hits the surface of a sphere at distances from a source and it drops off very rapidly. This dramatically reduces the range that nukes can deal material damage across in space, so your missile or courier had better get that warhead as close as they can. Let's say they left the package right on their doorstep. What happens? Firstly, we see a bright flash, so bring sunglasses. There's no fireball here because there's nothing to turn into a fireball, with the exception of the remains of the device itself, which very suddenly became plasma before promptly spreading out everywhere without doing very much. All that energy released by the weapon will have heated up the surface of our target, so much so that its outermost layer would have turned into a gas and followed the device's plasma off into the darkness. This near instantaneous vaporization of the target's outer skin causes shockwaves through the material, bouncing back and forth and spalling chunks off it from both sides, creating a glittering rain of glowing hot particles. What is left behind remains just as hot, and may very well be deformed. The target is left reeling after this attack, in a literal sense as the force of the vaporized armor pushing the ship away acts just like an engine. Fragile pressurized systems may now be leaking, needing the crew of the ship to act fast to keep air, water and propellant from escaping to vacuum. But they cannot, because they were the unfortunate targets of an enhanced radiation device, a neutron bomb. At that distance, every single person aboard the ship would have received a dose high enough to instantly render them comatose, with death following not long after. This is because the most dangerous part of any nuclear weapon in space is not those destructive physical effects, but a wave of deadly neutrons. An enhanced radiation weapon is a deliberate design change to maximize its neutron yield while minimizing everything else. Oh yeah, and this works over much larger distances, dozens to hundreds of kilometers, and you don't even need an enhanced version to do this sort of damage. Every nuclear device creates neutrons. However, it is possible to shield against them, there is just a severe mass penalty for doing so. In fact, a neutron shield is a potential component of any spacecraft that has a nuclear reactor on board. A wily captain can point this shield in the direction of an incoming nuke and hope it protects them. While I'm thinking about it, this heavy neutron shielding is probably why colonial ships like a Galactica were so large and heavily armoured. Not only did it protect from guns and explosions, but the devastating effects of neutrons too. But these weapons still require you to get their water heads relatively close to their target. In a realistic setting where ranges can be measured in thousands of kilometers, how can nukes be made effective? One method is to use them as a power source for another, longer range weapon, the bomb pumped X-ray laser. Like all good realistic space weapons, these originated during the Cold War as one of many concepts whose goal was to shoot down many ballistic missiles before they could reach their target. The first version was conceived at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory, the home of the giant cheese slice door, under Project Excalibur. The basic theory is using the X-rays created by a nuclear device to excite a rod of lasing material made from zinc. 
Excite here is a technical term, it's not a child going to a theme park, and means that an electron has lots of spare energy and can emit photons. The zinc lasing rod emits its photons in the form of an X-ray laser before promptly being consumed by the explosion. The benefit here for missile defence was that one bomb could pump a lot of lasers at once and take down a whole bunch of ICBMs in one swoop at the speed of light and at a much longer range than the bomb by itself could cover. You don't even need to point all the lasers all over the place, you can aim them at the same target, focusing the every direction blast of the bomb onto one area. Another way of focusing the blast is what I alluded to in the missiles video, the nuclear shaped charge. These take our nuclear device and encase it within a sphere of X-ray opaque material, with a hole at the top. As X-rays move at the speed of light, when the device is triggered they all bounce around and find their way out of this hole before everything is turned into plasma by the blast and find themselves striking a filler material. As with an explosion in atmosphere or underground, this material turns our X-rays into heat, which then hits another, denser material that gets both vaporised and propelled at high velocity. We have taken a spherical explosion and turned it into a hypervelocity cone of plasma. And what do we use this for? Well, it's for a propulsion, of course! Our plasma strikes a big old shield on the bottom of a craft and pushes it forward. This is the fundamental principle behind the Orion Drive. The whole Orion project and all its derivatives are beyond the scope of this video, so subscribe now for a future look at it, after Star Sector adds them so we can use it for cool footage. Naturally, this idea of directing a nuclear explosion was turned back into a weapon. Rather than optimising the design for propulsion, it was modified to become even more focused, even higher velocity. It became a nuclear spear. It became the Cassava Howitzer. And yes, something as badass as that is named after a melon. Just like the bomb-pumped X-ray laser, these are more of a directed energy weapon than a bomb. A plasma bolt whose velocity can potentially reach into small percentages of light speed. Despite this high velocity though, it's still going to have its range limited by the rate of spread of the plasma, but this range will be far greater than the effect the bomb alone can have. It's also possible to make a design deliberately less focused and shorter range, for use as a defensive weapon to completely obliterate incoming weapons fire across a wide volume of space. There are two other kinds of nuclear shaped charge, both of which use the same fundamental concept that's been in use for anti-tank weapons and other purposes for many decades, adding a metallic liner to the business end of the shaped charge. Unlike the denser material that becomes a plasma on the Orion Drive and Cassaba Howitzer, this liner is intended to remain as a solid object. The first kind uses a highly inverted cone of metal as its liner, making use of the Monroe effect that amplifies penetration when a hollow shape is made in an explosive. When detonated, the blast shapes and moulds the liner into a jet of high velocity metal, travelling much faster than the explosion that projected it. However, the jet continues to change shape as it moves, so its effective range is fairly short. The same technology can be applied to nuclear weapons, generating much higher velocity jets, but unfortunately while they have good penetration, their limited range makes them difficult to use. You still need to deliver your weapon close to the target. The second kind uses a liner that is at a much shallower angle. Rather than forming a short-lived jet, this instead projects the entire liner as a single unit, and we have ourselves an explosively formed penetrator. If we are careful in selecting our materials and use something that can survive, like say tungsten, we can take our nuclear device and turn it into a devastating kinetic energy weapon. And these aren't limited to small projectiles either. A 1 kiloton warhead can yeet over 20 tons at 9 kilometers per second. Nothing is going to be able to stop that. The only hope you have of surviving such a hit is by avoiding it. But is 9,000 meters per second too slow for you? Lasers can go at the speed of light after all, so 9,000 isn't that impressive. If we introduce a gap in our shaped charge between the liner and the filler material that actually propels it, remember that? We can more efficiently capture the energy from the blast. With some other fiddling with our design, like reducing our liner's mass to only a few kilograms, we can use our 1 kiloton warhead to yeet a projectile at several hundred kilometers per second. Scale this up to bigger warheads and you can slap multiple tons of metal across huge stretches of space in the blink of an eye, which carry enough energy to crack a battle star in half. So nuclear weapons in space may not function quite the same way as they do here on terra firma, but they are still very much capable of causing catastrophic damage. I've talked about six options here, the standard nuclear device, the enhanced radiation device or neutron bomb, the bomb pumped x-ray laser, the cassava howitzer, the nuclear Monroe effect weapon, and the nuclear explosively formed projectile. 
All of these have more detailed information out there for you to look up, and all of these are options for you to include in your own fiction. And you don't need to be fully realistic here. Stargate, Battlestar Galactica, and Halo all use nukes, and you probably don't consider them to be hard sci-fi. Just bear in mind the consequences of having such powerful items in a setting. It may very well be better to use some of these weapons more sparingly, giving them the large impact on a story that they truly deserve. Thank you for watching this video on nuclear weapons in space. If you want to see more content in this vein, please like the video and subscribe for more, and hit up the comments to tell me what you want to see. To support the channel directly, you can use the fancy super thanks feature, become a channel member, or join our Patreon as these people on screen did. Thank you for supporting if you choose to, and thanks again for watching.